Hello, everybody. Can we just clap for the joy that came from this conference? Daniel, that intro was like a, a proud, embarrassing father. And it was very sweet. Thank you. And there are many people in this room who are far better equipped to speak on this topic than me. Um, because I've actually been, I've been eavesdropping on all the little conversations, all of the rooms that we've had, all, all of the different conversations that people have been having. And whether it's about an, uh, transformation of a financial system or whether it is about <clears throat> somehow thinking about how we address racial justice or gender equity all of these different things it always comes down to this idea of well the system needs to be redesigned the system was designed to oppress the system the system the system and and that that answer, it always ends there. We, we get to talk about it and we live in this really complicated nuance where we live in this old world and we have to survive in it somehow, but then also we're really trying to build a beautiful new world order that is based off of these lofty principles. And so we're stuck in a way, but we're doing that bridging work. And so the challenge here is that I'm presenting is what happens after you say this system was made to oppress by design? What happens after that? And, and that's what we're going to explore today. And so our amazing opening speaker, Sean Hinton, um, said that plagiarism is the greatest form of flattery. So I, I feel compelled to also say that I, too, am a hypocrite. So if you were here the first day, he said that I am a hypocrite, meaning we're gonna talk about all these beautiful ideas on, on truth and nobility and transformation of communities. And I am not perfect at all whatsoever. I am just learning how to do these things. I'm standing on a stage, but in reality, we are actually holding hands and we're walking this path together. So I too am a hypocrite. Please do not look at me as the expert. I'm just the one standing on the stage, kind of aggregating all of the beautiful things that I've learned from all of you. Um, and so with that said, I want us to understand historically how we got here. And so in, in, in the spirit of our opening speaker as well, he said that plagiarism is the greatest form of flattery. And so he started thinking this beautiful story about his marriage. And so I graduated college about three years ago, three and a half years ago. And so I thought I would give a little bit of my story. So I went to a school in California called UC Berkeley. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the school, but it is well known for being um, the history of the civil rights movement. It is well known for being a very good school in engineering. Um, it is very well known for being an elite school. And what oftentimes happens at a school like Berkeley is that the students get really competitive. They, they have these paths and, and they're sent there by, by their parents and they're sent there by their own vigor to, to do amazing things. And, <clears throat> I was one of those students who was like, I, I want to change the world. I want to better the world. I, like many young people who were deeply inspired, said, okay, if I want to change the world, I have to become a human rights attorney like Amal Clooney. That is the way. That was the only example I had. And so that was the path that I decided to tread. And when I started getting my education, I got really jaded. By, by the elitism that was at the school, that about the way that my peers were treating one another, the humongous disconnect between people in all these other parts of the world and all of these communities, even the communities in Berkeley and Oakland, which are right next door to this beautiful palace of an institution. And, and it felt, I felt really lost. I didn't understand what my impact in the world was beyond I want to change the world, I need to be a human rights attorney. So I ended up dropping out and I, I didn't tell many people because I said, I'm going to figure it out. And I ended up working at this very small Persian market in, in Berkeley called Middle East Market. If you ever find yourself there, go there and tell them you know me not. And one day, I, I was serving people all these different types of food and I was so upset about, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm doing with my life. 
and I'm, I'm just, I'm coming here every day trying to get my buck. I don't know what's going on. And one day I served somebody uh, a cup of tea and I was so, so happy. And it gave me space and a moment to reflect of what actually is the impact that I want to have in the world. Okay, I want to fight against racism. I want to fight against sexism, patriarchy, imperialism, colonization, economic exploitation, uh, extremes of wealth and poverty, all of, all of these ideals. And I, I started asking, what is the root? What is the root of those things? And when I started to really think about it, I realized that all of these issues are actually the symptom of a problem. And that, that problem is that our entire social and economic systems are built off of an idea that human nature solely lies in self-interest. And so I started reading a book by an amazing scholar named Ibram X. Kendi, who wrote the book Stamp from the Beginning. And he actually posited this so beautifully for me to understand. Oh, please enjoy. Um, for me to understand that when we think about racism and, and the way that it exists, and I live in the United States, which racism is a very pertinent issue, especially systemically, there's this idea that ignorance and hatred come first, and then that creates uh, racially discriminatory policies, and then that leads to really bad systems. And that is actually a very ahistorical take. The truth is, is that all of these uh, racially discriminatory policies that came to exist were because of the self-interests of the people that needed to create specific markets. And so with that being the underlying reason, they needed to create justifications for creating markets that actually allow for the exploitation of people, which we can look to the origins of slavery with this. And so I highly recommend you read this book. He talks about all of these different theories, like the, the, the ham theory, the curse theory, of all these ways in which racism became justified. But it, be, it came down to this idea of self-interest, the self-interest of people that for some reason, they felt that it was okay to, to take from another, to exploit from another. This is such a, a vile phenomenon that even the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah, reprimanded the West as uh, for its time of colonization and the violence that came from it. And so while we're thinking about this, I want us to also remember that a lot of these things, a lot of these systems that we keep talking about, we, we don't under, we understand that they're covert, but sometimes, sometimes we can't trace them. And if you can't tell already, I am a very big history nerd, and so I'm going to give you just one more example of, of how this has happened in society. Um, during the time of the Ottoman Empire, uh, around the 18, like around the 1880s, um, Europe, Europe was really starting to modernize, and the Ottoman Empire and all of its nations actually wanted to catch up, and so. In that spirit, the, the Ottoman Empire ended up uh, buying a lot of technology, started a lot of development projects, and what ended up happening was those development projects weren't actually making enough revenue to pay off uh, the, the debts that were taken out. And so that led to the creation of a committee called uh, the Ottoman Public Debt Administration, the PDA. And it was through this entity that the European powers were able to start influencing uh, the ways in which financial capitalism could lead to, to, to the colonial intervention of a lot of these countries. And so I, I share that to not bore you with financial capitalism, even though for some of you that is a great passion, um, but I share that to say that these things are really nuanced and those systems and, and the way that they operate are um, they're very they're very niche, but what they all have in common is this underlying idea that all of these systems, all these social forces we've talked about, they are part of uh, this system of domination, the impulse within one aspect of human nature that human beings can can dominate over the other, 
And so this seduction that comes with the power to dominate is what really needs to get addressed. And so when I think about, okay, I was, I was on this journey in college, I was thinking about what, what how did this get designed? Where, where did this start? And it actually started on the building of what we now think of today as a user archetype. Thank you, thank you. I get heated, sorry. Um, so it was built off of this idea called homo economicus. The idea that was actually coined by uh, John Stuart Mill um, in 1883 that the human existence, the reality of man can be defined as a self-interested human being. And this concept went on to actually build a lot of the economic theories that we understand today. And so if this is the core, core starting ground definition of, of what a human being is, and that working in your self-interest and the acquisition of wealth is what defines a human being, of course what perpetuates out of that are going to be other things that operate out of a place of greed and a place of envy. Of course we are going to have systems of domination. And so when I was in school and when I was serving that cup of tea to one of the beautiful people that always came to Middle East Market, I said, aha, I got it. What I want to do with my life is all these systems that are built off of this idea of homo economicus, I want to design systems that are built off of the truth about human nature. The fact that we are created noble and that we have a lofty nature. The prophet Baha'u'llah of the Baha'i faith has said that we are created noble in, in the Bible. The book of Genesis says that uh, man is created in the image of God and all of the, the religions of God, uh, the messengers that have come, the highest minded philosophers, the loftiest of poets, all of these people have said that human beings are created to be noble. And so this is truth. This is what we know to be true. So I had my aha moment. I, I had my moment of, okay, this is where I'm starting. And so I went back to school and I said, now I know my purpose. I'm going to build new social and economic systems based off of the nobility of human beings. My professor said, okay, good luck with that. And, and with Godspeed, we're trying. And so, of course, that now begs the question of, what does that actually mean? What does that actually take? And, and, and where do we start? And so I think now it's important to interrogate this idea of design. So everybody keeps saying that the, the system is, is designed uh, at its core to, to be rotten. It's, we see homo economicus. It was designed at its core to be rotten. It goes against the spiritual truth. So now we have to understand how do we actually then use the power of design to, to build new systems that uphold human prosperity. Well, everything in this world has been designed. So this building, this event, the clothes we're wearing, uh, the earrings I love to wear and make, uh, the, the grass that is outside, everything that we experience and feel has been designed. And so I actually, I love this quote. It is by a man named Henrik Most. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody in this room is familiar with Virgil Abloh. He was the late um, founder of a brand called Off-White and the creative director of Louis Vuitton. But this man was his mentor. And he was a great designer, uh, Virgil Abloh. This man is also a great designer, creative head of Ikea. And he basically says that we don't realize that a doorknob doesn't work until it's broken because you forgot that it was designed. And so design is simply the idea that we're creating a system that work, works. It's something that works. The way the door handle turns and squeaks or, or, or how easily it swifts, this is how you know something has been designed well. We use the word designed well, but really it's just designed. And so we kind of have to briefly understand, since now we're, we're all we're walking on this journey together of, 
I'm a systems designer of the New World Order. You're all now systems designers of the New World Order. You're adopting this language, even though you all already are that. Um, we have to very briefly understand the history of design, uh, the way that it's been used. And so I'm really not going to bore you with the deep nuances of, of each of these areas. But it is important to know how these things have been used to actually create the society that we currently live in. And so participatory design can be the earliest traces of this. We see that in the way that when Plato um, was thinking about the creation of the city-state, he said, well, everybody that is a member of the city-state needs to come together and be a part of the creation of what that city-state does and how that functions, how it was designed. And so that's where we can see the birth of grassroots democracy, of how these people came together to, to um, to design their cities. I'm not going to interrogate how well that went or not, but that is where a lot of that inception came from. Then we have user-centered design, the idea that, okay, we're going to focus on the end user and, and, and that's, that's who we're designing for. Let's not think about necessarily who is designing it or what is being the designer of that, but user-centered design, we're thinking about who is the product for and that's the end. Service design. Thinking about, okay, who are the different stakeholders? Who are the different members of the supply chain that will end up experiencing this product or this experience or whatever it is that is designed? So, so really thinking about, okay, the final output. But then we have this new era, this era that is, let me actually stand here. We have this new era of, of human-centered design. And so that's this idea that, okay, everything that has been created, we, we need to incorporate the people that are experiencing it. We're starting to see now in society that what we're designing actually has consequences that sometimes we don't know how to track. And so human-centered design really pulls on this idea of empathy and bringing all human beings that are part of, of the design into the process from, from beginning to end. And then they said, well, Human beings are very different from one another. They have very different lived experiences, they have different needs, and so we have universal design that started thinking about, okay, uh, what are the needs of the most vulnerable people of the room? How can we design something that, that you know, can address everybody's needs? And so that's when we, we see the invention of a ramp. That's when we see some of these things that, that can make way. And then inclusive design, that is starting to think a little bit deeper of, of those value-sensitive beliefs. That, that needs to be designed for. And so this is, this is the history that we need to understand of, okay, all of these things have been used to create things. Even boardrooms have, been, have used these design ideas to, to be created in this way. And so I wanna go back to Virgil Abloh, who, who created this idea of a design language. And so we walk through some of these other forms of design, we, as systems designers of a new world order, we need to create our own personal design language. And so I, I, I highly recommend you watch this talk if, if, that's, if you're curious to learn what, what his are. Um, it's a Harvard Graduate School of Design talk. Um, highly recommend it, great guy. Um, but we are going to create our own design language inspired by, by this idea that the principles that you create, the principles and, and the tenets of this language, anything that you can create, really comes back to this practice of ethos that is this language. And so many people in this room uh, are members of the Baha'i faith. Many people in this room just are deep, deep rooted change makers. Everybody in this room is an ethical person trying to, to build anew and do better. And so with that, we need to be thinking about how do we create a truth-centered design framework. Because like we said with Homo economicus, that was built on a lie. That is, that is not the full truth about human nature. And so now we are starting to, to build anew based off of the truth of human nature, that we are created noble. And so with that, I want us to really think about this idea of nothing for us without us that came from the, the South African Disability Rights Movement and it became the foundational tenets of, of what is called design justice. And so we're gonna add this idea of design justice in our truth-centered design language. 
Um, this is actually a, a body of work that is already in the world and is existing by a group of amazing economists, community organizers, artists, scholars, so on and so forth. And I share that to say that there are beautiful, like-minded people out here in this world that are doing work that is really aligned with what we are trying to pursue here together. And so this idea of nothing for us without us, uh, which I actually love that Homa shared this in, in one of our earlier sessions uh, this weekend as well. So a lot of you will see little tidbits that have actually been communicated this weekend are gonna show up in here. So we really are all thinking about this together. So nothing for us without us. Starting with the disability rights movement in that you cannot design something for people with disabilities or for any group of people without them being in the center and being the protagonist and able to, to, to create what is going to inevitably serve them. If it is for them, they have to be not only part of the process, but, but they have to be um, enabled power holders, which we'll get into a little bit. And so I want to draw our attention to one of my favorite concepts that has come out of the Baha'i writings. And it's this idea of likening uh, the, the black community at large to the pupil of the eye. And so the idea with the pupil of the eye is that the pupil is what enables light to pass through it. And that is what enables us to see. And so if we think about that in terms of this context, what, what Abdul Baha is actually positing here is that because of all of, of the historical oppression that black people have experienced, they are also enabled with a spiritual potency and heightenedness that enables them to see things with their spiritual goggles that we, or I, I am not a black person, that I must listen to and I may not necessarily have that spiritual privilege to see and understand. And that is why, that is a true form of power. And so thinking about this idea of, okay, they have these spiritual goggles that enable them to fully see. And that's what enables the light, all of the light around it to, to shine through the eye and enables us to see life in true color. We need to think of this idea of centering the people that have true knowledge, what we define as that spiritual knowledge, at the center of whatever it is that we are building. Testing, one, two, three. Okay, we're still here. Um, and so I want us to really ingrain this idea of centering the true knowledge holders of society. And so when we think about people with disabilities, we think about houseless people, uh, we think about prisoners, these are oftentimes the least valued people in society. But they are the ones that have experienced the, the systems that we are talking about redesigning so much. They are the experts of these systems because they've lived it. And when we think about all of the different types of identities, when we think about, when we think about black people, when we think about indigenous people, we think about uh, LGBTQ people, we think about immigrant co communities, we think about people who are from whether the Midwest of, of the United States or they are from Gabon, Botswana. Whatever your lived experience is in that system, in that place, in that reality, you become the expert of it. And so this really changes this idea from the most elite being the true, the true knowledge holders. Um, and, and I want to name that sometimes this idea is what we see being a source of discomfort in our society. And that's when we talk about these ideas of privilege, that, that a lot of us have privilege and a lot of us have um, really complicated relationships to power, that we have to look very, very deep inside of ourselves and begin to bring out and address so that if we, whoever we are in, in this systems design work, that we can prop up the true knowledge holders so that we can support them and so that we can be working hand in hand but simply having different roles. And so I'm a, I'm a big lover of, of evidence, of history as you've clearly seen, but also I'm talking about lived experiences and I only really wanna talk about my own and no one else's. Um, and so I have some, what I'm calling case studies, but are, are honestly programs and projects that have been really close to my own heart. 
that can maybe help us think about this idea of practicality. So as, as Daniel Truman mentioned earlier, uh, for my adult life thus far, uh, I have been working at an amazing company called Second News, uh, which is an impact and innovation agency that is working to, to build new economies and, and trying to put some of these ideas in, into practice, but with entrepreneurship or with visionaries in, in specific. And so in one of our programs, which is called the Headstream Program, uh, we were working to create a new digital ecosystem. And so you can think about this in the context of young people today live on social media, they live on technology, uh, this is uh, an inevitable, inevitable part of their lives. And so we started thinking about, okay, how do we build a tech ecosystem that actually is designed to uplift the well-being of young people. And so that started thinking about these very specific technologies created by really, really high-minded entrepreneurs. But my job was, okay, there are no young people here, <laughs> and we need young people to actually be directing the, the creation of this ecosystem. And so we created a series of virtual programs that brought together young people from all over the United States, from really different places, very different identities, and oftentimes very, very, very marginalized low-income communities. And what we found was that there were a lot of nuances in our design choice. Sometimes it required us to stay up till 2 a.m. And, and actually read through hundreds and hundreds of applications that of a lot of people that wanted to be a part of this. Sometimes it required saying no to the superstar kid because we wanted the ones with the lived experiences of how their lives were really transformed, sometimes negatively, by technology to be the designers. And when we started putting them in this space, what we realized was that these young people, which we all know, are incredibly smart and incredibly capable, but they needed an understanding of technical knowledge of how the system operates. So having lived experiences and having high-minded, lofty morals are necessities and essentials. But you also need to understand how a system operates, what are the technical aspects of it. In this case, it was how does big tech actually design something? How is a corporation run? How is it designed? And so these ideas started giving them a window into thinking about how, how we can use our lived experiences and apply them here. And so I really want to think about this idea of demystifying technical knowledge as a key component of being these systems designers. I'm gonna go a little bit faster. Um, and so another program that I was able to be a design practitioner on was called the Incubation Network. And so what this program was focused on was thinking about, okay, there is a large amount of plastic pollution leakages in the ocean. And so when focusing on certain countries in Southeast Asia, what we realized was that the informal waste working community were by a large majority women. And they would end up picking up and, and creating almost like their own economy of an informal waste market. And so we began creating programming of how do we build the capacities of, of the waste management companies as well as these women so that they can be certified, that they can be actual formal waste workers while also thinking about their holistic livelihoods. So we would have these capacity building programs that actually thought about um, the divorce rates that a lot of these women were experiencing. Do they have homes? Are they, are they receiving, are they living in safe conditions? ESG scans, are, are we thinking about the safety of, of the way some of these waste management facilities were running? And so really starting to link the system, working with municipalities, so, so city governments, and thinking about, okay, how are they thinking about working with women? And so we started realizing that the only way that we could address this environmental issue was by intersecting the social impact and, and the gender equity of women. And, and lastly, I, I have a soft spot for this project because I really love the people who are a part of it. Um, 
but thinking about placemaking. And so for those of us that are, are really intimately thinking about grassroots community building in, in specific locales, and thinking about this idea of social action, this community in Battle Creek, Michigan, a very special community, there is very unique in that one of the largest funders in the world, the Kellogg Foundation, lives in this community, while also there's actually a large amount of atrocities that happen here. And yet, there's this budding community of, of black and brown artists that really want to build up and develop their town so that artistry revitalizes the soul of their city. And so what we ended up doing was we came together in a design process of really deepening on, on what is needed from the beginning to the end. And so we had several design sessions, several interviews, several convenings, uh, where we began thinking about, okay, how do we, how do we revitalize the soul of a city? And so with a spiritual lens of, okay, you all need to be the center. These outside consultants cannot be the ones coming in and creating this for you. You all are the protagonist. This is yours and you own it. And this idea of true ownership ended up creating a, an arts and culture collective that focuses on the advancement of, of the careers and, and the actual artistry of these individual artists while also thinking about how their community can be enhanced by artist, artistry so that tourism can come, so that money can flow in. And so that's what, when we start thinking about this material and spiritual development, th this was one of the seeds that really taught me what does that look like in practice? <laughs> And so, of course, to, to, have, to have a vision to design towards requires some, some radical imagination. I love the visioning activity that the EBBF team put together this morning because we have to start thinking about what does it mean to world build? What does it mean to deeply, deeply far into the future, imagine what this new world order should practically look like in our day-to-day -day lives so that we understand what does it look like to have every human being on earth live out their purpose and then work backwards. And so that requires us to, to find the truth in our histories and rewrite those histories. That requires us to, what, I, what many scholars have said, decolonizing your mind and to really begin that imagination work in a way that it is quite practical. Um, so I've clearly mentioned several times that I am, I am between these worlds. I am, I am living in an old world order and I have to pay bills and taxes and I am trying to build a new world that is beautiful and lofty and that resembles what I believe should be the kingdom of God on earth. And that's what, in my faith, it, it, it says we are working towards. I, I am personally of east and of west. I am between my dreams and I am between reality. And the truth is all of you are also between realms. Um, and so I, I invite you all to live between realms with me because this tiny little pink place is is actually where the work happens. That is where the work happens. And, and it actually starts really, really in, in micro ways. And so if any of you have either heard of this book um, or, or haven't read it yet, I highly recommend you read it uh, by an amazing scholar that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Ruha Benjamin. And, and she talks about this idea of um, really small actions can lead to vital justice. And that by watching the COVID-19 pandemic, you can see how inevitable it is when small, almost undetectable actions go viral, they go massive. And that is where world building starts. And it starts in those communities. It starts by applying your imagination. It starts with the arts and creating art that inspires people with, with living between realms and, and creating little bits of viral justice that, that meet people where, they at, where they're at and accept them and also walk hand in hand with them through that inspiration. And so 
we're all just trying to do work in the micro to lead us to that macro vision. Um, and so I hope that gives you a practical idea of where to start. And I hope that this talk simply just gather all of the genius that is in this room and begin thinking about, okay, what is my step? What is my next step? What is my vision of, of being this, this systems designer? So we can, we can build up that imaginative world of, of a new world order. So with that, I conclude with, with some of my resources. Thank you all so much.